Hi everybody, welcome back. Today we're going to be looking at a Marantz 250 power amplifier. Now these things are not for the faint of heart if you want to service them. They have kind of a long history to them and the one that we're going to be working on the bench here on is the earliest version. So on the Marantz 250 amplifiers there's a couple things you need to know if you're not familiar with them. They're one of the earlier solid state amplifiers made by Marantz. The earliest one had issues with uh, parasitic oscillation and with the bias circuit. We're going to address some of those things in this video. And then there were two other production runs that they did of these uh, during you know, production of, of the 250s. And in each version that they did, so there's three total, uh, they made some little changes or improvements to certain parts of the circuit, uh, especially with the bias circuit, um, and did some other things to try to quell the, <laughs> the oscillation issues. And then if you want to add a fourth version, there was also the model 250M, which is very similar to the 250, but with yet some more changes to it. So we'll go over some of those things in this video. Now, in part one, which this is, I'm only going to be concerned with getting the amplifier to function. It is a non-functional amplifier as it came in on the bench. So all we're going to do is go through the troubleshooting process. So I know a lot of you want to scream at the monitor, you know, do this, do that. But we're not going to do anything except get it to work right now. Once we figure that out, in the next part is where we will go in and actually try to do some of the uh, modifications or make some changes to make the amplifier a little more reliable and uh, also just generally clean it up and so forth. So if that sounds interesting, come along for the ride and that's what we're going to be doing in this series. Marantz 250 Stereo Power Amplifier. So there are several things I really like about this. Number one, it's a Marantz 250. Number two, as I understand, it has issues and will need to be repaired. And third, the owner, actually a friend of mine who finds a lot of the equipment you see on my bench, said that uh, I have the permission to purchase whatever parts it needs to do the repair correctly and to restore it back to its former glory. So this should be a lot of fun. I'm really looking forward to it and uh, I hope you are too because you're welcome to come along for the ride. Let's get to it and see what's going on. Now these amps do not have a power switch on them. So when you plug them in they, they come on. So <laughs> You kind of don't want to, if you're going to put this on your test rig on your bench, you may want to put it on something that has a switchable power so that when you, if there is a short or something, when you plug it in, it doesn't just come on and short things out. Now, I have this set up on the dim bulb tester. I only have a very low wattage bulb because we don't know what's wrong with this, but I was told that it has a problem, like a shorted channel or something. So when we turn this on, we're going to see what, if we have any shorts and most likely unless it's the power supply that's shorted uh, it just won't come out of protect mode but the I don't think it'll damage anything regardless we have our dim bulb on there so let's uh, see if we can get everything in shot here as I drop my phone and We'll see what happens when we turn this all on. Here we go. I have not powered this yet, so this is the first time. And of course, these are enormous capacitors in here, so it doesn't surprise me that that tiny little bulb lit up so brightly, but it has dimmed down. And uh, that tells me that the filter capacitors are charging. And we're down to 69 volts, so the rest of it's being dropped across that bulb. So I think the main problem is this thing draws a lot of current, so 
it normally. So let's go up to another bulb. I'm going to turn this off. And not bad. Uh, we aren't getting any illumination on the front panel lamps yet. Of course, we only have 73 volts. Uh, on the amplifier right now. But that seems to be a little bit excessive for just the amplifier sitting at idle. So there's something shorted in there, we can tell. Uh, you see how bright that bulb is? We're drawing a half of an amp, seven or 518 milliamps, and we have 73 volts going into the amplifier, the rest being dropped across the bulb. And again, a 110 watt bulb, I, well, I don't know, they, that is, th this does have a pretty high idle current. <laughs> if you look at the service manual, it'll tell you. But uh, there are no dead shorts that we can see. Let's go to a bigger bulb. Okay, I now have a 300 watt bulb. And it still drops down to about 79 volts. And now we're drawing 1.4 amps. And so there is a short in this amplifier. There, Obviously, it's not a dead short, uh, or you would have the full voltage across that bulb right now. But that is a lot of current and a lot of wattage. Uh, there's 95 watts total <laughs> in the circuit. And that's an awful lot for uh, we still don't have panel lamps or anything like that. So first thing we want to do is see if we have a shorted power supply or partially shorted power supply. All right, working on these can be a little bit tricky because the way these are put together, the chassis itself is kind of a U-shaped piece of metal. So this, the back, the bottom, and the front are just all one piece of metal. They are just have two 90 degree bends, one in the front and one in the back. And so working on the amplifier modules is very simple because the heat sinks actually make up the sides of the amplifier. So when you remove the heat sinks, these fold out to the sides and you can service them and get at the amplifier. But if you have to work on the power supply or the metering circuit, you really have to unwire things to get them out and it requires a lot of disassembly. I want to make sure that uh, we know the problem before we start to take anything apart. So we're going to take a few measurements and we're going to always start with the power supply and we're going to work our way back. And what we're going to try to do is we can separate our amplifiers. You can see right here uh, each one has its own wire. So we can remove power from one side and the other, or from the whole thing, and see if we are actually getting a short in the amplifiers or in the power supply. So that's what we're going to do next. All right, as you can see, I have the wires marked for right and left channel. And these are the sources. They're still connected to the capacitors. And I kind of have these precariously <laughs> dangling in midair. And what we're going to do is we're going to turn this on and see if our dim bulb uh, goes, goes dim after it charges up. I think I have the bulb in the shot here. So let's turn it on. And look at that. It dims right down. And most likely the protect relay should come in. Yep, it's trying to come in, but it can't quite. I hear it buzzing. It's trying to come in, but it can't. So that's good. Now let's look at what our power is. I'm sure there's going to be some insane voltage on here right now. Yep. So these are charged up right now. And the good news is it tried to pull in the protect circuit and most likely if I had no current limiting in there, the protect relay would probably come in. So we definitely have a shorted channel. So let's discharge these bulbs and I just have my little 
discharge jig and it's nothing but a light bulb in a socket. It's just a low wattage, 25 watt or something like that. And we can use this to discharge. And it's not a big deal. You can see it doesn't, <laughs> on, a, on a lower voltage supply, it's really not a big deal. And you can see that one's all discharged. Okay, and then we'll measure it and make sure these caps really don't, aren't holding uh, a really hard charge, so they may be starting to get tired. We'll have to check them eventually. They'll most likely get replaced anyway. All right, so now let's go to ohms. Let's go from ground. We don't see anything there. We don't see anything there. We don't see anything there. And we don't see anything there. And if we go right, nothing bad. Left, nothing bad. So most likely that's telling us that in the amplifiers themselves, either we do not have a shorted output or we do have a shorted output and the emitter resistors are blown open as a result of the short. So we're not going to know that yet until we test a little further, but the amplifiers do not have any dead shorts on the power supply. So what's happening is when the amplifier is powering up, what is happening is one of the amplifiers when it comes up, it turns on a transistor <laughs> that then connects to a shorted transistor or something like that. And that's why we're drawing excessive current. Now what we can do is we can try connecting one channel at a time to see if the amplifier will come up and if the current will still drop down, you know, or it'll stay real high. And we'll compare the right channel to the left channel. Okay, we're going to start with the right channel connected. We're going to turn the amplifier on and we're going to see what happens with our current. And you can see it dims right down immediately. And if we hear that little buzzing noise, now I have my... Sorry, I just put my mic on. So we started with this, with the right channel connected and you can see the bulb dimmed right down and the protect relay is buzzing a little bit like it wants to come in. So there's no problems with that channel. So let's turn the amplifier back off. We will discharge our capacitors once again. All right. And we'll do this one. All right, and we'll move over to our left channel. We're going to repeat the process now. So let's turn this back on. And you can see the bulb does not go dim. So our left channel is the culprit. So there is something shorted in our left channel. So it's just as simple as that. So just by playing around with our power supply, we've learned quite a bit about how this thing works or how it is failing. So now we know we can, we can get down to our left channel and troubleshoot it and see what the problem is. We know our power supply is working and we know that the right channel at least is coming up and not drawing excessive current. Okay, I have all but two of the screws removed from this side and taking the cover off of the output transistors, right away we see a problem. Look look here, there's a screw missing. So it looks like somebody has been here before us and must have checked, some, you know, found a bad component and just put it back in and decided to sell the amplifier rather than fix it. I'm just assuming, I don't know. Okay. So we don't know if this is the NPN or the PNP side. It's probably the PNP side. So we'll go negative on the base. 
right here. So base collector, base emitter, nothing. Let's switch it around. Base collector, base emitter. So that one's good. And then if we go em emitter collector, So this is a good transistor, so even though there's a screw missing from it, it tests good. So emitter to collector does not have a short. Emitter to base. So this is a NPN transistor. Okay. Okay, NPN once again. Good. 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 So this one reads okay. Okay, these are PNP, so we'll check this next one. Got to switch our leads. Good. Good. No shorts. So that one's good. Okay, last one. Good. Good, good. So all four of our outputs are good. What are we going to do now? I guess we should just go recap the whole thing, huh? Okay, I hope you can see everything. I have the board out of the amplifier now and off of the heat sink. Let's start with these driver transistors. You can see right here is one pre-driver and the other pre-driver. So the base is going to be driven off the collector, so this is your base. Now I don't know if which side is which, so I'm not sure if this is the NPN or the PNP. And it's not reading that way, so it must be a PNP. Okay, so we have a drop there. Drop there, that's good. And then if I go from here to here, no shorts. Now on this side, here's a collector. I'm going to here, and I'm going to assume that this is going to be an NPN. It'll be the opposite polarity, and it is. There's that. And that's good. And then nothing. So this one, these two transistors are good. All right. So now let's go follow back. Here's the base, and it's going into the collector of this transistor. And the base is going to be the middle pin, and these are the pre-drivers, and they're, if you can see, they're up on these heat sinks, one here and one down here. So let's take a look at those. So this is the base, and again, this is probably a PNP. Yep. And this one does read a voltage drop from emitter to collector in one direction, but there may be other circuitry in there that you're reading across, so we can't go by that. And then we have an NPN on this side, I'm going to say, and we do, and that's good. And again, in one direction we read something, in the other direction we don't. So I'm going to say those transistors are good. Now, of course, we don't know what the gain, like if we have a transistor with really low gain or with shot noise or something that fails when you put load on it, but so far none of the transistors are bad. Let's flip this around like so. Let's go to ohms and let's check our emitter resistors for the outputs. That one's good and this is 0.15 ohms and of course the meter is going to have about 0.1 ohm, so you should see 0.2 something. And we do. That one's good. That one's good. And if we can get to it, that one's good. Okay. So here's our differential pair right here. So we should be able to read that. And again, we'll look at the base. I don't know if these are NPNs. I'll probably go back to trans or to diode check. 
again, we can get out a fancy transistor checker or something if we want. Okay. Let's go this way. So these are NPNs. That one's good that way. And that one's good that way. And no shorts there. Okay. And let's do okay, that one's good there. That one's good there. And we're reading, looks like a, we're reading across a capacitor there, so that's not a short. Okay, now I think uh, we have a, we have a phase inverter and its associated current source somewhere here. I don't know which one's which, but let's check this one. Okay, and let's compare it to the other side. So we're going to go from, let me flip this around. Okay, that's kind of weird. That's reading a little bit, a little high if you ask me. And am I, that's good there, but this side here, Okay, it's all right. It's just I'm not getting the leads on there right because I'm reaching around the camera and everything. So that's good. Okay, we're looking at the simplified schematic for the circuit boards and for this amplifier. And what I'll do is I also have a copy of it that I can put up on the video on, you know, as a picture and you can if you want to stop the video and look at it a little more closely, but we went back We've already checked these transistors here, which are your outputs. We checked our drivers, which are those ones that are on those little heat sinks. And now we need to check our bias circuit and uh, to make sure that there's not something wrong with those. And I'm not sure where all of these are located, so we're going to have to look at the, the uh, board uh, map. And there is one here. I have the whole service manual, as you can see. We'll go through and look at that. Okay, so that bias transistor is actually this little block here with the screw on it. And it attaches to the heat sink. So it can thermally track with the outputs. And the base is the blue wire we go to emitter and we go to collector and you don't see it. Let's see here. So base. So base to emitter is good. Base to collector. Let's see here if I can get on it. Is good. And emitter collector. We read a voltage drop that way and we read a different one this way, as you can see. If I turn that on, different one that way. So, I think what's going on here is you're just reading across something once again. But that transistor does not look as if it is shorted either. What you're going to see is these two little dome top transistors. These are your input and the current source. So this is going to be the input, which makes sense because it's right next to this little coax coming in here. And if we go to the base of that, it looks good. And I don't see any shorts there. All right, and it's climbing up. That's a capacitor. And again, this is reading like a PNP transistor. And again, so I don't see anything, I don't see anything that's jumping out 
right now as being a faulty transistor. There are also some capacitors here. I really doubt that those would cause what we're seeing, although they could if something was really badly shorted. We can check ESR on them, although high, high ESR wouldn't cause this problem. Ooh. Okay, so that capacitor is completely shot. That capacitor is not great. That one's not bad for its size. Again, not too terrible. Because remember, these are low value. But this one here, this is a 220 microfarad. It is completely shot. So let's look and see what those are and if those could have something to do with it. So this really bad capacitor is right here. It is C507. And if you follow it, it goes, uh, let's see here, where does it go? It goes from your bias circuit to ground or I'm sorry, your DC, DC offset circuit to ground. So if this, if, this dia, if this capacitor is shorted or leaking really bad, it will, it'll, leak the, it'll leak your DC offset right to ground and it's gonna turn one side of these transistors completely on. I don't know if I was on, on frame the whole time, but you can see how that goes to ground. There's your ground, there's that 220 microfarad capacitor right there it connects to the arm of your DC offset pot and the ESR was really bad on it so I'm going to pull that capacitor and I am going to check it a little more thoroughly uh, out of circuit all right let's connect this up to the DER the DE5000 can see I have it connected and it's reading high and the dissipation factor is horrible look 4.46 and what that's telling us mm -hmm. is the capacitor is pretty leaky it's really not acting as much as a capacitor as it is a resistor now comparing that let's take a brand new 220 microfarad 10 volt. This one's 6.3, this one's rated at 10, so they're almost identical. So we're going to put this one on, and when we look, almost 220 on the spot, 217, and look at the dissipation factor 0 0.081. Remember, it was 4.6 or 4.5, and uh, I'll show you some other things here. Okay, sorry about the wonky angle of the camera, but I actually have the 4276 out. I set it up on the bench here underneath my spectrum analyzer a while back, and um, there's a whole series of these. This one's really not worth. If I, if I, I wouldn't buy one. <laughs> I would the the. 4275 I think is the one you really want because it's it'll operate at high frequency like up to what in the megahertz and it's good for testing real high or real uh, high frequency capacitors but neither here nor there this is a good piece of test equipment um, if we connect this up to it I have this set to absolute impedance mode and as you can see it's in series it's showing this as being 22 ohms which is pretty high but look at the loss tangent of this thing it's minus 12.4 it's supposed to be minus 90 <laughs> it's way the heck off so that's telling me this is a really leaky capacitor uh, again put putting a new capacitor in you can see the resistance drops way down and we're very close to our minus 90. It's minus 85.1. And that's where you would expect it to be uh, with this. 
So this just guy that kind of gives you an idea how bad that capacitor is. So we need to replace it. I still am a little bit skeptical. That is directly connected between ground and our DC offset. So maybe that's all that's wrong, but i would be kind of surprised if it is. We're going to stick this cap in there and put it together and just see if that changes how it works. Well, we have another hitchhiker. We're going to have to get him out of there. Okay, you can just see down here where I have this capacitor replaced. That's the only component I replaced. And I put new screws in here and I just tighten them back down. All right, we're hooked back up with our jumpers. Let's go back over to our bulbs and let's turn the power on and see what happens. Nope. That did not fix it and I didn't think it would. So we still have an issue with these and we're going to have to figure out what it is. So we know it's not a bad transistor, at least a shorted one. So now we're actually going to have to go in and take some actual voltage measurements. And to do that, uh, we're going to have to kind of rearrange this so we can get to it a little bit better. Okay, let's put the microphone on. Keep forgetting the microphone. All right, I'm just going around and taking a few voltages, and everything looks good except when we look at, uh, well, the DC offset was a little bit wonky, and I touched that up just a little bit. So there's 0.6 and 0.6. That should be, it should be the same voltage on the emitter and collector of the bias transistor. That means they're kind of balanced. And we got that now. And the only thing left, I think, is the bias. Because these transistors actually are starting to get a little bit warm. So I'm going to turn this pot on the bias and see what happens with our light bulb. I'll try to catch this all on here. We'll see what happens. I don't know if I can get everything in shot. I think I can. Here we go. All right. Let's see. Oh yeah, look at that. Oh boy, that pot's bad. The pot's bad. The pot appears to be bad. Did you see it drop when I turned and now it's... We have a bad uh, bias pot. Okay, so we have the pot taken apart here. I don't know if you can see it from where I... There we go. And this is a wire wound potentiometer. Never, ever spray, never spray deoxid in there of any kind. Not the fader lube, not the red stuff, nothing. These wire wounds, you can put a little bit of the QD quick dry cleaner and just very lightly touch this. But these little tiny wires in here will break. I mean, so easily. This is not something you just want to spray cleaner in it. You have to take them apart. For the center contact, the wiper contact, you can use one of these little fiber brushes. And you see how I polished it, being careful not to touch the, uh, the wire wound part itself. And then the little wiper contact itself you can see it. See that little tiny tab right there? Very hard to see, but see it? And you polish that a little bit. And that's really all you do. You don't want to touch anything else. We'll clean that up, and uh, this will be ready to go. So the good news is this pot is good. And we'll check it from end to end one more time to make sure we have proper continuity. Let's see here. And we do. It's a 1K pot. So that's it. 
So now I'm going to put this back together. And again, I'm going to be very careful. I'm going to move this somewhere in the middle of its travel range, like so. And then I'll put this back in, like this. going to put the back on it once again. We're going to fold these tabs over and we're going to try it out. Okay. And let's see what we have here. And I'm going to rotate this. And again, it has to stay. <laughs> the meter changes ranges so it makes it look like it's going intermittent, but it really isn't. It's the meter jumping ranges on you. So you see how nice and smooth that is now. And it's going to change ranges, and there it goes again. And it should go up to 1K roughly, and it does. So we're good. So that's really all it needed it was to be cleaned a little bit. So let's put it back in. I don't. That may have been the problem, but I highly doubt it. I think when we when we adjust that bias to a certain level, that something is run, one of these transistors is kind of running away on us. Okay, it's all back together. Let's go over here and see what happens to our bulb. That's more like it. And if I turn the pot now, I should be able to make it brighter and dimmer. And there it goes brighter. There it goes dimmer. Now that's all the way down, which I still think is more a lot more current than the other channel is drawing. We're going to turn this off for a second and we're going to hook up the other channel, disconnect this one over here and see what we get. Now I've switched over to the right channel leads. Let's turn over here see what happens. And you can see it gets a lot dimmer so we still have a problem and you can see if I turn this on and leave it on you might even see the you can hear the relay is trying to come in of course it's being limited by the bulb but we still have a problem here it's still not right okay the plot thickens so what we have is, if you look on the schematic, I'll show you the original one we have here. And what you see is you have this bias transistor with your pot, and then you have this diode going across the collector to base. And these are not in one package. I thought originally they were. They are not. Essentially, this is in one package and it is in this little block down here. This diode actually is this one and I've removed it and it was tucked inside this heat sink of the pre-driver. Now when I separated them it got kind of interesting. No matter how I tested this transistor it comes out good so I tested it with you know, the, the multimeter and diode check mode. I tested it with, you know, one of those little component tester things. Uh, did all the tests and this came out good. This, however, is kind of interesting and I'm glad I did the testing that I did because you'll see how easy it is to be fooled. Right now I have the meter set on diode check. And remember, this is just a standard diode. As a matter of fact, it is a 
one n. What did I say it was? It was a one n uh, five forty two. And if we read it with the regular meter on diode check, you get blocking in one direction, and you get a normal diode drop in the other direction. And it even changes with temperature. So if I hold my fingers on there, you'll see that voltage drop will go down. And that's what it's supposed to do. So far, so good. So it would lead you to believe that this is good. But here's where it gets strange. This meter told us it was good. If I connect just this simple, cheap little component tester to it, and I turn this on, it sees that it's a capacitor, and then it says damaged part. Which is very strange, and I said, well, wait a minute. How can this be reading good and this telling me it's bad? So I went one further and I broke out the little voltmeter here, the VOM, and I put it on high sensitivity. Now this uses a 30 volt source uh, to measure when you're in times 100,000. And if I connect the leads the one direction, Okay, you can see it reads forward, and you know, essentially, because it's on such high sensitivity, you're seeing no forward resistance. It, there is a little bit, but there is a small voltage drop, but you're not seeing it. But if I put it in reverse bias, here's where it gets interesting there's about 800k of leakage, and so as a result, our little component tester was correct. And this meter in diode mode is not sensitive enough to catch that. So I guess the moral of the story is you can't always rely on just one method of testing things because that one method may not definitively tell you everything you need to know about a component and it's either functional or failed state. Okay, it is now off the leash. There's no dim bulb on it. And all I did was, of course, the good old venerable UF1004 diode in place of that old uh, germanium diode. And you would think you can't replace a, they always say you can't replace a germanium with the, you know silicon, but in this case, this diode wor is very happy in there and it's idling at about 12 watts. And that's what each channel roughly should be. So, and I have plenty of adjustment now. I can turn this up and down, and you can see it adjust as I turn it. And I have no current limiting on it whatsoever. And the uh, protection relay pulls in just like it's supposed to. The amp is working. Now it's not thermally tracking because I don't have this coupled to this transistor here. And I see the reason they put it on this one because this one gets pretty warm once it starts idling like it should. So I'm going to probably now put things kind of together and connect the other channel and try testing that to see how it compares to this one. I will tell you this thing will break into oscillation if you even look at it cross-eyed which is a really bad thing. Um, and it just has to do with the design of this amp. So we're probably, that part of it could have to do with some of these capacitors being so bad. But there's a lot of work to do to this thing, but it does work now. It functions and we can pass signal through it. Well, it's off the leash and I have the bias turned way down. And if I turn this on, I get a really nice one kilohertz signal. Very nice. Okay, now that we have this back into a working order, let's talk about what I don't like about it. And the main thing I don't like about this bias circuit is, well, everything. <laughs> First of all, if you look 
at this midpoint. The only thing keeping the bias where it should be is this transistor. If this transistor were to open or it would fail to bias or this pot would go bad, basically it would leave this an open circuit, this, this midpoint. If you do that, these will skyrocket. In other words, these voltages here and here will just skyrocket, which are, these are your drivers pretty much. And these are going to turn on full bore, and you're basically going to burn out your transistors. And this is something that happens on this. Uh, this is a known problem with these. And since your current limiting circuit, you know, kind of works in the earlier stages, it's really not going to be able to throttle anything. So this is just going to, these are going to slam on and they're going to burn up. So this is a terrible circuit because it makes it that it's not fail proof. The best way to do this would, to, would be to have a shunt, like a, a diode drop shunt across here, and then have this circuit squelch some of that out. So, so if this were to fail open circuit, you would still have the, that diode string, which would give you excessive current and would run, make the amp idle hot, but it wouldn't blow out your transistors. It would limit it to a certain maximum quiescent current that's somewhere above where you would want to calibrate it. So really I would like to redesign this a little bit. I don't want to get too crazy because there's all kinds of ideas that we have that we could go with this, but I want to try to do something to make this a little bit more reliable. The other thing is this amplifier will oscillate if you fart too close to it. It just oscillates. It's just terrible. And uh, you know, you saw with the normal signal generator connected, I got a beautiful clean signal, but it doesn't take much to get this thing into oscillation. And when it does go, it goes whole hog. I mean, it's high frequency and it just really, again, it'll just melt the amp down. Now, again, part of that could be due to the fact that those other electrolytic capacitors have not been replaced yet. So, we're going to look into that a little bit more as we go along, but I really want to get this perfected on this one channel, and then when we decide a game plan for how we're going to do this, then we'll do both amplifiers and we'll do them professionally. Then we're going to strip out this chassis, clean it properly, and uh, put it back together. But at least we were able to find the problem and correct it. And mainly, there were a couple small things. Number one, the transistors, transistors were not screwed down properly. Number two, this capacitor in the bias circuit was leaky, very, very leaky. Number three, this diode was faulty, uh, the, the actual, the original one that was in there. And this is a germanium diode. It got a little bit too leaky. <laughs> so those three minor, and the pot needed cleaned. So those four minor things, they really weren't high dollar, right? Nothing was. One diode and one capacitor. The rest was just work. Um, that's all that's wrong with it right now. Everything else is functional. So I'm going to end this part right here, and I'll get it posted. And I have some different parts on order that I'm going to wait for them to come in and then we're going to tackle rebuilding these these boards and then we're going to go and do the whole clean the whole amplifier and kind of redo it so that's it for this particular episode I hope you enjoyed it um, this was a nice challenge for a little bit and I enjoyed that and like I said we're going when we come back we're going to we're going to have some ideas for the bias circuit until then, I wish you all peace, joy, happiness, and good health, and we'll see you again real soon with the next part, although for the next two weeks, I warn you, I am going to be exceptionally busy, and I may have little to no time at all to work on this, so we may have to pick up at that point in time. All right, we'll see you all later. Bye-bye.